Welcome in. It is Big Ten today. Great to have you with us on this Tuesday. Dave Revs and Rafael Davis. First four starts tonight. So I guess officially this is the beginning of the NCAA tournament, the most enjoyable three weeks on the sports calendar. I can't wait to get it going. I'm super excited. And if you haven't filled your bracket out, I'm here to tell you why six Big Ten teams are going to make the Sweet 16. Six. I got six of them. Maybe seven. I wouldn't be surprised if seven made it. Wow. That is a bold prediction. We will allow you to tell us why and how throughout the hour. Our big story is those eight first-round tourney matchups involving the Big Ten. Again, it all starts on Thursday. you got five teams in action on day one of the tournament starting very early with Maryland and West Virginia. Three more on day two. The eight teams that are in for the Big Ten, of course, one shy of the all-time mark, which was set each of the last two seasons. Still a really good haul, though, tied for the most of any league. Let's start with the Big Ten team that got the number one seed, the Purdue Boilermakers. We've had some time to digest it since we were together on Sunday night when the bracket was unveiled. How do you feel about their draw? I really like their draw. I look at it, I look forward. I think they're going to get Memphis in that second game if they take her business. You never want to look past your first, first opponent, but I think they're going to get F, FDU or a Texas Southern. And then you get Memphis in that second game, and I think that's the game of the tournament for Purdue, being able to handle Memphis's pressure. The thing about playing Memphis, you break that initial pressure. Once you beat it, they don't really guard you in the half court. It's not like they're Rutgers in the half court setting. I think they throw the ball to Zach Eady. It kind of breaks the spirit a little bit, that press weakens. And then they're off to the races. Okay, that being said, if there is one issue for Purdue, the biggest one is yep. pressure on defense. So you say, well, when they beat the pressure, then they're not going to guard you. Yeah. What about beating it? Yeah. I mean, are, are you confident in those guards against pressure in a tournament setting, whereas we've talked about – during the course of this year, it has come undone a little bit at times. I'm confident because they have a few days to work on it. They just saw it a few times. You get Rutgers, you get Penn State. Now they got a couple of days to watch film on it, see what they did wrong. You heard Coach Painter and the presser. The guy like Brandon Smith, you want the ball in his hands, but he can't just make one cut to get the ball. Sometimes guys in college basketball, you make one cut, you're open, and then you stop. Purdue's got to make the second cut. If they're able to make the second cut, turn and go up the floor, and not just catch and stand and let, let them trap them, I think that'd be fine. But it's all about doing what they work on in practice every day. Okay, so let me ask you about this. I mean, as I look at the draw and have thought about it these last couple of days, look, I think Purdue is a great team, and I think they have a really good chance of getting to New York and then ultimately – of getting to Houston, but it seems to me that, you know, Memphis, and then if, if you look ahead and you do, in fact, get to an Elite Eight game against Marquette, it does feel like those are two teams yep. that are well-constructed to give them trouble. I mean, you think about Shaka Smart and his history with pressure defense. Yep. I, I'm not saying the bracket doesn't lay out well for them because, you know, potentially you end up, uh, if, if Duke were to, Pull off a win there, potentially end up with a Duke team. You'd be pretty handily mm -hmm. this year. I mean, I think there's a lot to like about it. Yeah. You just wonder uh, uh, about that defense. The flip side, and I think the, the thing that I felt all along about Purdue when you get into a tournament setting, and the reason I'm really optimistic about them, is no one has dealt with anything like right. Zach Eady. I right. mean, you can go through everyone on the bracket. No one's dealt with it except for the teams that have already played him. I mean, right. you know, Duke's already played him. They, they didn't deal with it particularly well, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. you know, if you go to the other side of the bracket, like Gonzaga played him, they didn't deal with it pretty well, all that well. So the, the Big Ten teams, I, I don't want to say they've learned how to deal with it because the guy right. was the conference player of the year. Yeah. They, they were very hard-pressed to stop him. But I said this yesterday, there's like a shock and awe, I think, yeah. the first time you, you get up against it. And then Big Ten teams are built to handle a player like Zach Eady. Maybe not a 7-4 guy, but Big Ten, they're built to guard big men. You think of Hunter Dickinson, Trace Jackson Davis. Before them, you can go back to Jawan Johnson, Jared Sellinger, and, and those guys. So Big Ten teams have big guys. Other teams around the country, you look at Memphis, the tallest guy that gets valuable minutes is around 6'8", six, 6'9". Six, DeAndre Williams is a great player, but he's a smaller guy. And even against Duke, I know you won't get the same Duke because they're more healthy now, but they were 2 for 19 from 3 in that first game. They're not going to shoot it that bad. But the thing about it is, Edie was able to foul out both of their big guys. Filipowski, he wasn't able to be effective, and then he fouled out their, their center. So when you put pressure on a defense that way, you get to the free throw line earlier in the one-on-one -on -one situations. And then you can think about Marquette. You beat Duke. You've beaten Marquette. It was a home game. But I don't think, I don't think Marquette's going to get past Michigan State. 
I think if there's one team where I trust to handle pressure out of the Big Ten, it's Michigan State because they have those three guards. And I don't know if you get a hooked up Tyson Walker, a hooked up A.J. Hogard that's ready to go, that's showing good body language, Marquette's pressure won't bother them. And then once you break that pressure, I think Michigan State will do a good job. The way they've been shooting the ball around the perimeter, they need some production from Matty Sissoko. He's only scored 20 points in the last six games. You don't need 20 points in one game, but maybe eight a game, that'll help him. And then Malik Hall has got to be confident. He was 0 for 6 in the tournament, scored three points. If they get production from him against Marquette to go along with those three guards, I don't think you could speed a good A.J. Hogarth up. We'll dive more into the Spartans coming up in just a little bit. What about Indiana, though? I thought they were treated really favorably. Yeah. They got a four seed. <laughs> they do draw what, by all accounts, is a really good 13 in Kent State, you got the Rob Senderhoff sidebar, which I don't think really matters to players, right? When you no. got a guy who was an assistant many years no. ago, right? <laughs> players, don't know. players don't care. I mean, that's the kind of thing that the media loves to talk about. No yeah. different than the Bruce Pearl Auburn against Iowa thing. Like, we all yeah. we all talk about it. Makes for an interesting sidebar yeah. and, and a story. But ultimately, you go out there and play the game. Yeah. But but there are challenges clearly that Kent State provides. Is certainly already that one has kind of become a fashionable upset. What do you think of the Hoosiers as they dive into this bracket? I mean, I look at Kent State and I look at Indiana. It's like playing a Big Ten game because Kent State, they hang their hat on their defense. They only allow 66 points a game, 40% from the field. They force 16 turnovers, score 18 points off of lows. It's just like playing the Rutgers, just like playing the Northwestern, a team that's really tough inside, not going to let you score much. And then they got a guy like Sincere Curry. Where he's had 11, 20 plus point games, he can score the ball at will. But I really trust a guy like Galloway to defend at a high level. If you get a hooked up Galloway and Miller Cop, if you get to Miller Cop and Galloway that was at Mackey Arena against Purdue, they combined for 26 points, I think six of 11 from the three point line. I trust Indiana in this game because I don't know if Thomas, if Thomas Myron, if he can handle a TJD. He's never seen one like that. Right. Yeah, and that's the other thing. I, I do think kind of along the same lines of Zach Eady, Trey Jackson Davis yeah. is a very unusual player. And with all due respect to the MAC, which is a really competitive league, you're just not seeing no. players like him on a night out, night, night in basis. What about Miami? Uh, Miami is playing really well. And, yeah. and were they to match up with Miami? Uh, here's a team with really good guard play, a yes. team that pounded Maryland. Yes earlier this year. What do you think about the potential of that matchup and the way the rest of this Midwest region plays out? I like Jalen Hushafino against their guards. Their guards don't pressure you. You look at you think of the guards at Miami, they like to play free flowing basketball, get up and down, Nigel packing those guys. They don't put a lot of pressure on the basketball defensively. And when you got a Jalen Hushafino coming off a ball screen at the top of the key, if he's comfortable, if he's able to get to that elbow and get to his 15-footer, it's going to be money all game long. You've seen what happened against Purdue and other teams throughout this year. If you're not pressuring him, if you're not up on Jalen Hushafino, he's going to pick the defense apart. And then on the inside, you know Miami is really good offensively, but defensively they struggle. I think they're in the, they're in the hundreds in defensive efficiency. TJD, again, is going to be a big factor. This is a tournament where TJD's got to have his imprint on every game both ends of the floor because defensively you think about those Miami guards getting to the rim. TJD is not just one of the better defenders in the Big Ten but in the country. He is a rim protector and teams watch film. They see the shots he blocks and as a player I know as a fan as media we may not think of it but when I'm watching film and I see this guy throw this shot to the front row I'm thinking about that when I drive the ball inside. So I tr again I trust Indiana in that one but it goes down to is Galloway going to be able to stay in front of Nigel Pack? I think he will, but Miller Cop is going to be a big key in that one because Tamar Bates as well, those three guards at Miami, they really like to drive the ball, and sometimes teams pick on Cop. How would you feel about a matchup with Houston? With Indiana? Yeah. I would like it. I would like it because I like, again, I don't think Houston's going to get past Iowa, but <laughs> I would really like it because you think of Houston, sometimes they struggle to score the ball. I mean, they've had games in the 40s this year. In Indiana, when they're hooked up, those two road guys, Cop and Galloway, but they're making shots. When they're playing in the 80s, 70s, 80s, and they're running up and down, I don't know if Houston can score enough points. And with a hooked-up TJD and a race Thompson, they have the toughness inside. Because Houston, they just want to bully you. They just want to punk you out. They're going to hit the offensive glass. But if Indiana has that TJD toughness, I remember he got in Mason Gillis's face at Assembly Hall. If they bring that attitude and don't allow themselves to be punked, I like them against Houston as well. And you do have the uncertainty for Houston surrounding Marcus Sasser. That's yep. another one where the 
reporters in the media would have a field day yeah. on Kelvin Sampson yeah. versus Indiana, right? I mean, this would be... He recruited me. We, we talk about it nonstop, yep. right? I'm not going to ask how many text messages were <laughs> sent and when they were I was sent. in the yeah. eighth grade. Yeah, I don't, well, I don't want to I don't want to <laughs> open up that whole ball of wax. Uh, the world has changed dramatically since then. But that being said, it would be, be a great. really compelling story, yeah. but none of it matters to... To the guys no, out on the court. No, right? I would have no care in the world who the Oak. Those, I'm telling you, those guys, like a Hushafino, he's not from Indiana. You right. think about Malik Renu, Tamar Bates, those guys, I would not be surprised if they don't know who took Indiana to the fin- their last Final Four. Yeah. If you put up a poll and you gave them Bobby Knight, Mike Davis, and those dudes, they're, they're going to vote Bobby Knight. I don't know if guys really, I got, there's guys that I didn't know produced assistant coaches in the 90s outside of Bruce Weber, Steve Lavin, and then I learned about Coach Kendrick and all of those guys, but if you're not from the state, if you don't know the history of a school, that's why I love what Coach Payne has done at Purdue. He's got a lot of Indiana guys that care about Purdue, but if you don't know the history, you just, you just flat out don't care. Yeah. <laughs> and it's yeah. sad, but. <laughs> no, I, I think it's just the reality, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, just, I, yeah. I think those things matter more to fans typically than yeah. your players. I'm not sure there's a value judgment on it. I think it's just kind of <laughs> this is what it is. It's the nature of when you have programs that re- can recruit nationally. Right, yep, exactly. Right, and you exactly. go out and you find the guys who are the best fit for your program. A lot of them might be from your state. A lot of them might not be, and that's just the, the, the way that it is. Hockey, the all-Big Ten team announced today it is Minnesota heavy, as you might expect, given the fabulous year that the Gophers had. Logan Cooley, Matthew Nyes, Brock Faber all making the first team. Michigan with two selections, Adam Fantilli and Luke Hughes, while Notre Dame's Ryan Bichelle got the nod as the first team all-conference goaltender. Individual awards, Nyes is the Big Ten Player of the Year. He led his team with 21 goals this season, the most by a gopher in three years. Seven of those were game winners. That is the most in the country. It is the first time in conference history that a team has won the award in consecutive seasons. Ben Myers captured it last season. His teammate Brock Favor is the Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year. Favor led Minnesota with 49 blocks and headed a defense that allowed a Big Ten best 2.23 goals per game. Faber just the second player in conference history to win this award in consecutive seasons, joining former Gopher Mike Riley. As you might have surmised from the all-conference team, Notre Dame goalie Ryan Bichelle, the Big Ten goaltender of the year, he led the nation with 1,183 saves and a 931 save percentage. It was the most saves by a D1 goalie since Cal Morris had more than 1,200 in 2018 for the Irish. Michelle joins Morris as the only Notre Dame netminders to win this award. And no great surprise here, Michigan's Adam Fantilli, the Big Ten Freshman of the Year. He leads the nation with 60 points, would be the first freshman to have the most points in the country since Kyle Connor did it, also for Michigan in 2016. Third straight season of Wolverine has won this award, sixth time overall. That is the most, more than the rest of the conference has combined. Uh, the Big Ten Coach of the Year goes to Bob Motzko. He has led the way for a top-ranked Minnesota team that dominated the conference in the regular season. The first coach in league history to win this award three times. His squad will play for the Big Ten Tournament Championship this Saturday against Michigan. And as promised, Bob Motzko joining us now. He is today's big interview. Coach, congratulations. I mentioned you've won this award a few different times. What stands out about this team and its accomplishments this year? What are you proudest of? Well, first and foremost, uh, I've always said, you know, I do a real good job coaching when I got really good players. <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, and it's amazing. I think every coach in the country and every sport's going to tell you that. And uh, what stands out the most for us is, is I go, go back a year ago, you know, in our sport right now, a lot of guys have the opportunity to leave and, and go pro. And we had a handful of guys that felt they had unfinished business, wanted to stay in our program, play at the University of Minnesota, play in the Big Ten. You know, Jackson Lacombe comes back a senior year. Uh, Ryan Johnson comes back a senior. He's a first-round dra- draft pick. And then, of course, Fa- uh, Brock Faber comes back, uh, our, our captain. So we had some real elite players in their upper-class years that came back for us. 
and and don't underestimate the the impact that that's had in our program. We've sure got we'll call them those young fancy pants guys, you know, Cooley, Nice, Nugrud, <laughs> who have had terrific seasons and they're great players. But uh, uh, you know, to go with Justin Close and goaltending for us, we had that mix this year of upper class leadership and and real heart and soul. Uh, young men who, who came back for the right reasons and for their program to, to blend in with that that young talent. So it's been, you know, the the so far it's been a special season for us. But we're in a, we're in a new season now and and, and new expectations and the the, the, the temperature is raised right now as we head into the playoffs. But um, we're sitting in a good spot. I want to get to one of those fancy pants guys. Let's talk about Nyes. Uh, we talk about what a clutch player he is. As you. Yeah watch him on a day-to-day basis what jumps out at you well we, we call him he, he's just a big bully uh, he, he's a beast uh, of, a, of an athlete uh, with a lot of talent and heart and character and, the, and every coach every sports gonna tell you the same you know when you've got talent that's one thing but when you got talent that competes uh, at an extremely high level and that's what this group does and, and, and Matthew has just got that fiber in him where every night uh, he wants to play in the dirty areas of the ice. He wants to be in the trenches. He wants the puck in big moments. And he rises to the occasion in big moments. And, and uh, what's so fortunate for us, we got a whole pile of players that want to do that. And it doesn't come around every year, trust me, when, when you get a team like this. And, we're just fortunate, and we're so fortunate Matthew's here with us, an Arizona kid, uh, and just had a terrific season. Brock Faber's been tremendous as well. We had him on the show earlier this year, and he really represented your program incredibly well. I know he's been battling the flu. Give us a sense of his health heading into the weekend here. Well, and this tells you what a warrior is. I mean, he... Last week he was sick the entire week, and, and it, was, it was nasty, and he lost about 14 pounds. Friday he came back to practice, so he missed the whole week of practice, and he barely got through the practice. And, and the last thing he said, he goes, don't worry, Coach, I'll be fine. <laughs> and he finally got some food in him. We had to get some calories in him on Saturday. And the game went on, and you would not have known that he'd been out. And, and just world-class athlete, uh, motor that doesn't stop. And in football terms, he's that, line, he's that all, all, all-American linebacker who just controls the defensive side of the play. And um, we can't, I mean, terrific leader, all heart. And, and he played with an injury about a month before that where, where he battled through, had to miss a couple games, but came back. Uh, and just doesn't miss, nothing phases him. He just doesn't miss a beat. And... That's why two years in a row he's the defensive player of the year in our conference, and, and he's our leader. He does get a ton of the headlines, and justifiably so. He's a fabulous player. He's going to be a fabulous NHL player as well. But one of the things that you talk about this year is that this is the best defense you've been around, kind of top to bottom. Give people a sense of the depth of this group and what makes it so good. Well, you know, it, it starts obviously the same names. I mean, Lacombe has had uh, uh, an unbelievable season. Ryan Johnson is as steady and a, as prolific as a puck moving defenseman as you're going to see as a senior. Faber, a junior. Mike Kester, who is quietly, you know, he's not on the all league teams, but very well could be. And just a terrific player. And then you add these three freshmen that we put in there with. Uh, uh, um, they have just stood so tall for us. Uh, Chesley Middlestat, Middlestat made the World Junior Team, uh, and they've just been uh, outstanding. And how they blend together, but they don't. They there's no ego in them. Uh, and we're playing seven D when they're all healthy, uh, and they they. D- you know, I've missed Cal Thomas in there as well. And, and it's an elite decor, maybe the most elite I've ever coached. And, you know, I'm getting a little older now. And if I, I don't think you could have it again. It's just one of those aberrational things that have, have fallen generational. We're so fortunate that, that this was the year that it all came together. But what I'm most proud of with this group is zero ego. And they share the spotlight. You know, one of the things we talked with Brock Faber, Brock Faber a year ago was playing close to 30 minutes a night, and that was too much. And we, you know, and with the start of the year, we said, we're going to be able to back your minutes off. And his, he goes, how much? And, uh, and we said, just a little. 
and it's going to help your game. And now he's having his best offensive year to go with it. And but they, they, you know, we've had a few injuries. Other guys, Carl Fish has stepped in there, done a great job for us. So the depth of it with physicality, offensive play is awful special. Well, Coach, you talk about it. You're in the postseason now. Obviously, you play Michigan for the Big Ten Championship this weekend. Give us a little bit of a preview of that matchup. Well, I, you know, as crazy as it's going to sound, I think Michigan's the best offensive team in the country. Uh, and I know I think we're right in front of them a little bit, but they battled some struggles early with a lot of young players. But once they turned the corner, you know, led by Fantilli and just a terrific freshman group and a, and a couple of young sophomores back in there. I mean, they are explosive, and you saw that last week against Ohio State where they score the first shift of the game, jump out to a 3 nothing lead, you know, and obviously with Hughes on defense. They're, they're maybe the most dangerous team in the country. And we, in what we, we, our building was sold out uh, hours after our game. So it's just going to be an electric atmosphere. Um, it sets up for a terrific hockey game. Two, you know, highly talented teams. Um, and I, I think it's just going to be one of those games for the ages to, to sit back and, and watch these two teams go at it. Coach, this is a program that is so steeped in tradition, obviously, as, as you well know, as a native Minnesotan yourself and having been on Herb Brooks's staff. You guys made the Frozen Four last year for the first time in eight years. The thing that has eluded Minnesota here over the last couple decades is a national championship. How much have you talked about that with your guys as you head into this postseason run? Well, we don't talk about that. Uh, we talk about getting ourselves in the NCAA tournament, being healthy and playing our best hockey at the end of the year. And that's something we really felt for the last few years that we've done. And, and, and truly, in one-and-done tournaments, and you know, basketball coaches are going to tell you, hockey coaches, you know, a uh, little bit of the luck of the draw and where your health is and how things are going right now. We're, we're getting everybody back. lacombe has been out for a few weeks. But we want to just be playing our best hockey. And, and uh, we have a chance. And that's all, I, that's all any coach can tell you. We put ourselves in a great position. We've got a chance. Uh, we've got great leadership. We're in a great spot. Um, we've got to get through this last Big Ten game before we get into that tournament and, and find our fade out on Sunday and where you end up. And, and I have learned over the course of time of being in so many NCAA, it doesn't matter where you go or who you're playing, uh, it's, it's a crazy tournament when it's one and done. you just got to be on top of your game. And right now I, I feel uh, we are, you know, we're coming off a little bye. We had one, to, you know, this game against Michigan State gets us rubbed up again. Now we get Michigan. Uh, we're heading in that direction to, uh, to, to what I hope we're going to be playing our best hockey once again. Big Ten Coach of the Year, Bob Motzko. Coach, congratulations. Best of luck this weekend and then going forward for the Gophers in the tournament. Thanks for spending a few minutes with us. Awesome. Thanks for having us on today. Michigan State will have a new women's basketball coach next year. Susie Merchant is stepping down as the coach of the Spartans due to health reasons. Merchant coached MSU for 16 seasons, captured two Big Ten titles, made 10 NCAA attorneys, though they have missed it each of the last two years. It is time for our big stat. What a run it's been for MSU's men's team, led, of course, by Tom Izzo. 25 straight NCAA appearances, the longest streak ever for any head coach. He was tied with Coach K for the longest entering this year, one ahead of Bill Self, who, of course, made it again this season. Mark Few, Dean Smith, it is quite a list. I know you are bullish on Michigan State. Why do you like them against USC? They're going to be playing, shooting twos to threes. I mean, USC, they're really good offensively inside. 73% of their points come from two and come from the free throw line. If Michigan State, if you can keep them off the free throw line, that helps. You, if you got to get production again from Matty Sissoko and Malik Hall on the inside because that's where they like to play. I like Tyson Walker and A.J. Hogard against Boogie Ellis. He gets this game on, averaging around 18 points. He's their guy from three, but the ball is in his hands all game long. They don't have a guy running off triple screens from three. They don't shoot a lot of threes. They're in the 300s of percentage of points from three. So I really trust Michigan State in this one. And then you think about how Michigan State scores the ball. It goes against where UCLA is good at. They're really good defensively inside. USC. I mean, USC, sorry yeah. about that. They're really good inside defensively. And Ohio State, I mean, Michigan State, they've been blistering the nets from three.
Yeah, really good outside shooting team, as we have seen all year. They led the Big Ten in three-point percentage in conference play. And I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but you have intimated you also like them against Marquette. Yeah, I do, because the way Marquette beats you, you think a shock is smart, they want to pressure you. They want to turn you over. They want to make the game a little faster. Vintage time is old basketball. Those three guards, they can handle pressure. They can handle the basketball. You've seen them against Presses, Maryland. They faced Rutgers. They've seen different things. It's all about A.J. Hogarth. I know Tyson Walker, he's coming to play. Joey Hauser, he's made shots. But A.J. Hogarth, he has to be hooked up. If you get a good A.J. Hogarth, eight, nine assists, one, two turnovers, I like Michigan State in that one as well. And then Marquette, if you do break that press, they're in the bottom third nationally in three-point field goal percentage defense. Yep. So that is part of the matchup that would favor Michigan State with how well the Spartans shoot it from the outside. Northwestern in for just the second time ever. They have stumbled a bit down the stretch, right. losing four of their last five. Is there cause for concern heading into this game against Boise State, other than you know, Boise State's in the NCAA <laughs> tournament yeah. and a good team? Yeah, Boise State is really good defensively at number two scoring defense in the Mountain West. So you've got to get a good chase all these. I think for Northwestern, they found their third score. And in college basketball, to have a third score, it's rare. Not a lot of teams have it, but they found it in Brooks Barnheiser. He's been great down the stretch. But Chase Aldiz has really struggled the last 10, 12 games. Hasn't shot the ball over 30% in a, in a while. But I think he's got to get back to attacking the lane, putting pressure on those guys from Boise State. They don't necessarily have a great rim protector. So I think with his size, his strength, and athleticism, get to the rim first, get to the free throw line, make some of those, and then start shooting those jumpers. If you get a good Chase Aldiz, a hooked-up Chase Aldiz, I think you beat Boise State. And then you have a really good chance against UCLA, in my opinion, because you got – Jaime Hawkins, you don't know if Bone is going to play. I really trust Northwestern's inside defense against those guys and their ability to keep them off of the offensive glass. Bone and Hawkins combined for five offensive rebounds per game. That's when Nicholson, the bruiser, comes into play. The size and length of Robbie Barron, the post traps of those guys, and then they just got to make shots on the, on the offensive end. Yeah, Dem Bona did not play over the weekend. He was injured recently here for UCLA, and then, of course, there are Without Jalen Clark, who is an outstanding defender. You're still talking Jaime Hawkins and Tiger Campbell. I mean, this is a, a fashionable ideas. pick to you got, shut them down, huh? You got you think about the Arizona game, Omari Bailey went off. If there's one guy that I trust to shut down a freshman in the country, it's Chase Aldiz. Rather, if it's Bailey or even you got Tiger Campbell, Ty Berry's become a pretty good defender. I mean, you just, you just never know. You do never know. I mean, that is the beauty of this tournament. Yep. What about Maryland? They are playing in Birmingham in an 8-9 game against West Virginia. And if they win that game, they would have to play Alabama in Birmingham. We were talking about this on Sunday. This just feels like it's going to be a really physical game. Yeah. I mean, you think about West Virginia. They want to make the game faster. They want to turn you over. But this isn't your typical defensive juggernaut West Virginia team. I mean, they're in the bottom of the Big 12 and scoring defense and field goal percentage defense. But that's where Maryland struggles sometimes. They struggle to score the ball. So in this game, I truly think the first five minutes will tell us a lot. If Maryland can score the ball and get into their press, because, you know, teams that pressure don't like to be pressured necessarily. And then it comes down to, I think, Hakeem Hart and Dante Scott, because Eric Stevenson, you seen him get 30 against Oklahoma, 30 against Auburn. He can put the ball in the hole. And that's where the athleticism of Maryland really kicks in. I think that... That game right me, that, that's a pick em game for me. I think West Virginia is really good. But I think Maryland, if they get Don Carey going from three, and he's playing like he has been of late, he's kind of coming into his own, I think he could be the difference. It does feel like two teams in a similar mold yeah. to one another, and it's just kind of going to be who can impose their will and who yep. can play the game that they want to play. Yep. It's Look, when you're in an 8-9 game, you can't sit here and say, well, that's a tough draw. But, I mean, Alabama in Alabama. Yeah, right? I mean, right. You, <laughs> If you win that game, it, it is going to be really challenging to get through to the Sweet 16. But, again, this is what it is. You had a chance all year yeah. to get yourself in a little bit better spot, and particularly on the road, it just didn't work out for the Terps. With Iowa, though, to me, it seems borderline unfair. Like, I just don't understand how you can be an eight seed and have to play a team who is a nine seed in its home state. Like, I just think that's absurd. I don't understand how Auburn gets to play in Birmingham. You should be rewarded for a great season if you have that. You need to be a protected seed. You need to be a top four seed. You can't get that as a nine seed. Iowa 
by their measure, has had the better season, and yet they have to essentially go on the road. I agree with you. I 100% am with you. I don't think it's fair for Iowa. You know that little meme of Coach McCaffrey, his anger meter. I think that was at the top of the anger meter for that one. But the thing about Auburn playing at home in Alabama is they go through scoring lulls. And when you're at home, if you don't score the ball and you're going through a three, four-minute rut, it takes the crowd out of it a little bit if you're not up and down in transition. And that allow Iowa, that could allow Iowa to score some baskets in that time. And if you, if Alabama, I mean, if Auburn lets Iowa control the tempo of the game, I really like Iowa on this one because Auburn won't be able to score 43 points like they did against Northwestern or 43 points like they did against Tennessee. They can get ran out of their gym. So if you get Payne Sanford, McCaffrey, and those guys knocking down threes, I think Tony Perkins and Wendell Green will be a fabulous matchup. Two strong, two strong guards that like to get to the rim. And then Iowa has an NBA forward in Chris Murray, a guy that gets 35 points in his sleep. I really like Iowa in this one because Auburn, I don't know if they can just score enough points or make enough shots. And you like Iowa against Houston. Oh, yeah, because well. to me, and no disrespect to Auburn, but – Houston is just the upgraded version of Auburn. They're tough. They're rugged. They go through times where they can't score the ball. You've seen them score in the 40s this year and struggle. You see them against, against Memphis in the championship. If Marcus Sasser isn't playing, they really will struggle to score the ball. Iowa's a team, if they're running and they're going, they're built for a tournament-style play. But, again, as everybody, everybody can say this, the guy's got to make shots. But I'd like Philip Rebracha as well against Houston because Philip Rebracha, he's not no punk. He's not going to let Houston just push them all around. There's no doubt if you get good Iowa, like good Iowa could make a really good run in this tournament. They have all the pieces. They don't turn the ball over. They have an experienced point guard. They have a superstar, as you said. They have, I think, the most underrated big man in the Big Ten in Philip Rebracha. But for whatever reason, it comes and goes. So. If it's, if it's coming, yeah. <laughs> right, if we spend uh, uh, two straight games where they've got it hitting on all cylinders, yeah. no doubt. I mean, they can make a deep run. We've been saying this about them all year. Because if you're a team that plays slow and you like to slow the game down, muck it up, but then a team comes in and they're running and gunning, guys like Marcus Sasser, guys from Auburn, they're going to want to play that way. And if you're not used to playing that way, like teams aren't against Iowa, that's when they force you to turn the ball over. And that's where Iowa is good defensively. You, ca- you try to keep up with their pace, next thing you know, you got 15, 16 turnovers. And, of course, Auburn really has to slow it down because they just don't shoot the ball well. Exactly. Right? They're 314th in the nation in three-point percentage. So they can't score yep. with you in that way. So we'll see. It's going to be a contrast in styles. I think it's a really interesting game. I love this about the NCAA tournament when you get two teams that play so differently going head-to-head. Two Big Ten teams in the West bracket. That is the most loaded region for sure. We've already discussed Northwestern. They're at the bottom of the West. Illinois is at the top in the 8-9 game against Arkansas with the winner slated to take on Kansas. I'm just going to say I would not be remotely surprised if Illinois makes a run in this tournament. We've been saying all year the talent is there. Now, again, I think much in the same way that we talked about Maryland and Iowa you did enough this year, enough that wasn't good, frankly, right. to put yourself in an 8-9 game. And yep. so now in order to make a run, you're going to have to be Kansas, right? You, you desperately want to avoid that 8-9 game, as anyone who's ever followed this tournament knows, which isn't to say you, you could beat them. But I love this first-round matchup. I mean, you, there's two really athletic teams that have some high-end potential. This could be a really fun game. Yeah, 100 percent. I mean, it's – like Illinois is playing against Illinois. And I think guy for guy, talent-wise, Illinois is not a nine seed talent-wise. They're really good offensively. It's just which Illinois team do you get? You look at Arkansas, they don't shoot the ball well from three. They're only 31% on a the year. They get a lot of their points from the free throw line. They got guys like Ricky Council, who reminds you a lot of a Terrence Shannon. It's very similar, similar styles of play. And this is a team where Illinois wants to get up and down. This is a team where they see – and say, we can play our style of basketball. But when you get a hooked up Matt Meyer, when you get a hooked up R.J. Melendez, you know Terrence Shannon is coming to play. I think a guy in this game to come down to will be the matchup Anthony Black versus Coleman Hawkins. If Coleman Hawkins is decisive with his passes, taking open shots, getting to the rim, rebounding at a high level, I like him in this one. And then with the Illinois team, Maybe it's immature. Maybe you shouldn't feel this way, but they get up for the big games. Matt Meyer gets up for the big games. So if you beat Arkansas, which I feel they should, they would, you get Kansas. Matt Meyer's going to get up for that Kansas game. Terrence Shane is going to get up for that one. I like them in that one just because of they have guys. They have talent. Illinois has 
three, four guys that can score 20 points in a game and get them over the edge. And then inside, Dane just built a presence. I think one thing that really stands out about Illinois and what makes them so dangerous in this tournament is you think about, look, they only ended up with two quad one wins, which, like, that's not a great number <laughs> when you play in a league as good as the Big Ten. So let's just call it like it is. But the two quad one wins were UCLA and Texas. Yeah, they get up for those. They've beaten <laughs> two two seeds. And UCLA, the team that they played, the UCLA they played, mm. is one seed quality UCLA. Again, they've had two significant injuries since then. So you look at their top end and you say, why not, yeah. right? I mean, again, they put themselves in a tough spot, but man, when they're at their best, they're really good. Your point, like Matthew Meyer was unbelievable yeah. in Madison Square Garden, right? Like incredible in that <laughs> Texas game. You just don't know if he's going to play video games the night before the game or he's going to drink some monsters. Yeah, but I yeah. think with Let's Illinois, <laughs> I think with Illinois, you, they built some confidence at the beginning of the season where they had the private scrimmage. You don't look at that and take, take it serious a lot. But they build confidence against Kansas already. They feel good matching up with those guys. I think Terrence Chan is a guy that can really affect Grady Dick, take him out of the game. And then you think of Coleman Hawkins and Matt Meyer defensively, the length, the athleticism. They really bother, they really bother Jalen Jones out there and just being able to get into his grill. And then the big one in this one, a big one for Kansas is Harris, the point guard. But also I think Sincere Harris and Ty Rogers, that's where they come into play. When you let Kansas point guard come off of those ball screens, throw those lobs to the rim, be comfortable, get out in transition, that's when they're really good. But I think Sincere Harris is one of the better point guard defenders in the league. In the country, he's going to grow into. I think he heats that up. Kansas had a phenomenal year. Yeah, 17 yeah. quad one wins for them. One more to get to, Penn State and Texas A&M. I think two grossly underseeded yeah. teams going head-to-head. -head. You understand why they treated Texas A&M like they did because they lost some really bad games early in the year, but you look at the way they've been playing here down the stretch, they've been really good, and we all know how fabulous Penn State has been, including in the Big Ten tournament. Yeah, three keys for that game for me if I'm Coach Shrewsbury in the locker room. I'm telling our team, don't foul them. Keep them off the free throw line. Texas A&M is number two in the country when you think about points from the free throw line. You limit their second chance points. You keep them off the offensive glass. They have guys like Julius Marble from Michigan State is there now, Henry Coleman. They, um, they almost average five, six offensive rebounds per game. So they steal points there, and then you can't turn the ball over against Texas A&M. They score 17 points a game off of turnovers. And Penn State is a team where that helps them because they don't turn the ball over. The ball is in Jalen Pickett's hands a lot. I like the matchup between Jalen Pickett and Wade Taylor. Wade Taylor's six foot. When you're six foot and you're a point guard, you're not used to playing against a center in a point guard's body like a Jalen Pickett. And then defensively, they're not going to be used to flying around guarding a three-point line. The matchup is clearly on that three-point line, yeah. right? We know how well Penn State shoots it. Texas A&M 50th in the nation in three-point field goal percentage defense. So yeah. there it is, right? That is a clear strength yeah. for them. It is a clear strength for Penn State, and we'll see who comes out on top. Wrapping things up on Big Ten today, there is no one more bullish on the Big Ten heading into the dance than the man sitting next to me. Ray Fell tweeting, Purdue wins it all. Iowa, Indiana in the Sweet 16. Penn State wins the guard battles, gets the Sweet 16 to play Xavier. Northwestern beats UCLA to get the Sweet 16. And Michigan State makes a run to the Elite Eight. So I want to clarify, this is a prediction. You, you believe I strongly in your heart believe. of hearts yeah. all this is going to come true. Okay, so let's dissect it. Let's start with Iowa's run. We've talked a little bit about it. Auburn and Houston, you just feel like they can outscore them. I just feel like Auburn can't keep up. Tempo-wise, they can't run with Iowa. And if they try to run with Iowa, they're going to throw the ball all over the gym. They don't have the shooters to keep up from three. If Payne Sanford is making shots off the bench, we've seen McCaffrey make five threes and a half. Tony Perkins can get to the free throw line at will. And then the big fella, Chris Murray, he gets them over the hump in that one. And then Houston is an upgrade at Auburn, in my opinion. I don't think they're going to be able to muck up the game because Chris Murray and Philip Rebracha, they're not chumps down low. They rebound the ball very well. Chris Murray can get a defensive rebound and push the ball. So then that pressure doesn't really bother him. Houston likes to be physical, and I don't think they could punk Iowa, and I don't think they could score enough either. Would be the first time since 1999 the Hawkeyes have made it out of the first weekend. I do think Penn State is built for March. Yep. We've been talking about this a lot. I just think they're an unusual matchup for teams. You don't see a team that does what they do. But 
Texas A&M and Texas are pretty good. Why do you think Penn State can beat them both? Because I like Penn State in guard battles. I mean, even Texas A&M, they have Julius Marble and Coleman and those dudes, but they're not throwing the ball inside. They're not feeding the post like a Purdue does Zach Eady or Indiana does TJD. It's a guards game. And I know how it is to be an offensive guy. When you get scored on by Jalen Pickett in the post, and he's telling you you're too small, that's going to make Wade Taylor want to come down and get a bucket. He's going to want to come down and score on him next. And that's going to – Throw, te- throw the offense off for Texas A&M because Penn State, they're built for Jalen Pickett to have the ball. Seth Lundy, Andrew Funk, they accept Jalen Pickett having the ball. Now Cam Winter, he's playing well off the bounce. And then I think about them shooting the ball from, th- from three, they don't shoot it well from deep. So they're going to get it. You get in the three-point shooting contest like Illinois did this year in the two games, you're not going to beat Penn State in that one. And the same with Texas. Marcus Carr, can win him a game, or Marcus, Park, Marcus Carr can lose him a game. And I think you get in a one-on-one battle with Jalen Pickett, you're going to lose those games. And Andrew Funk, Seth Lundy, they can, they can get going. Haven't won a game in the tournament since 2001. Northwestern in for the second time. You have beating Boise State, which feels like a toss-up game. But then beating UCLA, I mean, UCLA, yeah. again, I know they're banged up, but right. they are really good. Yeah, this is where people start to think I'm crazy. But you, the way you beat Northwestern, you shoot the ball well from three. They give up a lot of open shots from deep. You got to make shots from perimeter, especially when you think about the way they're going to post trap Jaime Hawkins. He hasn't seen a post trap like that in the Pac-12 with Robbie Barron and Nicholson and Verhoeven and the length and the size and the strength. But those guys on the perimeter, they don't shoot it well from deep. And then I think about the guard play. I think about Chase Aldige in the game Omari Bailey had against Arizona. He's not having that game against Chase Aldiz. He takes, he takes pride in his defense. Ty Berry stepped up. But it's all about Chase Aldiz offensively. If he gets him attacking the glass, attacking the paint, I mean, putting pressure on the defense, get Hawkins in some foul trouble, because UCLA, their big guy is banged up, I don't see why Northwestern can't get that one. Well, I think Northwestern fans would be happy to get to that matchup, yep. right? You have to beat Boise State, but you think about when they made it six years ago, it gave Gonzaga absolutely everything. Yep that it could handle, so not totally unreasonable. What about Michigan State to the Elite Eight? So that would mean beating USC, Mm -hmm. then likely beating Marquette and possibly K-State. I mean, obviously at that point, once you get the Sweet 16, hard to know how the bracket would play out, but that's that's what the bracket would dictate in terms of the higher seats. Yeah, we already talked about USC and the Michigan State's ability to shoot the ball from deep. USC doesn't guard the perimeter that well. Their strength is on the inside. You get some production from Malik Hall. You can throw them off there. And the way they shoot the ball from deep, A.J. Hogard, Jay Nakins, the way he's been blistering the nets. Tyson Walker is one of the toughest, top, toughest shot makers in the league. But then I think Marquette, they beat you because they speed you up. And when they speed you up, I don't think A.J. Hogard, Tyson Walker, and those guys can get sped up. I think they handle the press well. And once they break it, they're going to be able to move the basketball and get any shot they want. You didn't talk about Illinois here. Are you concerned about that matchup with Arkansas? No, I'm not concerned about the matchup at all. Illinois should beat Arkansas. But it's just which Illinois do you get? I don't, I don't trust Illinois in a sense. I trust Cus Underwood. But which guy in the locker room is going to go to Matt Meyer and say, yo, bro, we need you not to drink these monster energy. We need you to be hooked up and ready to go. The last one, I, I saved it for last. <laughs> Purdue winning the national yes. championship. I, I can shut my laptop for this. Because you got, okay. they're going to win that first game. You got Memphis in the second one. If you can handle that pressure, that initial pressure of Memphis, pressure in the basketball, Brady Smith is going to be key. He's got to make two cuts, get the ball, and be confident. But then they're going to pound it inside. They pound it inside against Memphis. Then they get to that Duke game. They beat in Duke. Duke Filipowski is already looking ahead. I got to play Zach Eady again. He fouled out in the first game. Duke will shoot it better. They were two for 19 from three in the first game. They're better than that. But I still trust Zach's ability to get the ball inside and score it. I think they get Michigan State. They beat Michigan State again. They get Arizona in the Final Four. That's going to be a good game. Arizona has the size. They have the strength. They speed it up a little bit. But you look at Arizona's guards, you look at Purdue's guards, you kind of think the similar things. Can they show up? And then I got them in a the championship. It doesn't matter who they play. They got the best coach in the country. They got the best player in the country. Now David Jenkins is making shots. Purdue, this is the season to do it. Well, I hope that you can speak this into existence because it would be really fun. They have been an incredibly likable team to cover all year. Uh, we are excited about this tournament. Again, starts tonight, technically, but two days away for the Big Ten. Can't wait. We'll continue to preview it on Big Ten today.